touched on it somewhere, somehow, I'm sure. Um, I did touch on the fact that prayer is a medium by which we access the realms of heaven, by which we access the power of God, by which also we access um, the mind of God, right? Um, we would look at Esther chapter 5, but I just wanted to look at the, the formation and the, the order in which the tabernacle was given. Um, the, the process, the building of the tabernacle and what it, 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 it was, was that Moses got the opportunity to encounter the Lord and have a picture of what the Lord desired in, in terms of the tabernacle. Now, before the temple itself was built and before they, they did the tent, right? The tent, they got into the promised land and they had the tent. What they had was the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant was what we would call in the temple area, the Holy of Holies. It was where the presence of God was and where the, um, you know, well, that was the point. So when the Lord was teaching me about prayer being a journey, it really starts with Exodus, right? 25, Exodus 40, where he's giving the instruction, this is where, this is how you build the tabernacle. Now you start from the gates, you go to the brazen altar, you go to the lever, you go to the lamp stamp, you go to the showbread, you go to the altar, and then eventually you get to the ark. Right. So this is the blueprint. The blueprint of what Moses saw of heaven is what we have in the tabernacle. Now, this is what prayer is and prayer should be to us, is what the Lord was teaching me. That prayer is a continuous thing. It was a continuous journey. It was an everyday thing. Prayer is like breathing, really, basically. Is that I do not see prayer or we do not see prayer as a place where I go to. Right. We still say that we are going to the place of prayer, but prayer doesn't end when we leave the place of prayer. In fact, prayer is carried along with us as we move, as we go, as we continue on our journey, because the point of prayer is to get access and to gain access to the mind of Christ. Now, when I come to pray, I can spend hours in prayer. And by the design of the Lord, he can give me his mind right there and then, right? As I am in prayer. We are not taken away from that. But I think even in that, we come to the place where prayer begins with um, worship, thanksgiving, confession, um, you know, um, supplication and all of those things. You see the progression of prayer, even in the way that you, the prayer itself is ordered. You see a pattern, you see a journey, like we are moving up. And up. So the Israelites are given this tabernacle model. And the point is that they would come from the gate and get to the holies of holies. Granted, the people themselves were not given access into the holies of holies, but the priest. On the flip side, when we look at the New Testament, that is not the case anymore. So instead of the priest having access to the holies of holies, the like him being the only person getting access in, now, scripture makes us understand that through Christ, we all have access into the holies of holies. What is the holies of holies? The holies of holies simply is the glory of God. What is the glory of God? The glory of God is the opinion and the reputation of God. So scripture says that we all with unveiled faces are being transformed into the image of God. How do we become transformed into the image of God? Through prayer. So if I see my prayer as the journey by which I become transformed into the image of God, then I wouldn't treat prayer as the place where I go to offload or load and then take back and then move on and then I'm done. But in fact, prayer is designed that we would have encounters of the image of God so that we can become the image of God. Prayer was given to me not simply because God wants me to ask for bread and tea. Prayer was given to me as a medium by which I become the image of God. I become like Christ. I become like the one unto whom I am calling. So if I see prayer in that sense, how do I pray? How do I pray? I pray with a consciousness. That scripture says that pray without ceasing. I pray with a consciousness of I am always in the mode of prayer. I am always in the place of prayer, regardless of where I am. 
I am consistently praying. And I know that we have um, this belief that consistent prayer um, is when I have, you know, like when I said six o'clock to pray, and every day at six o'clock, I come to pray. Every day at six o'clock, I come to pray. Every day at six o'clock, I come to pray. Every day at six o'clock, I come to pray. Now, this is important that we have such time set for the Lord. But I would, I would also say that the Lord is not holding us to a set time. Why? Because unlike God, the structures and the systems of our operations changes. Right. So, in fact, nobody can truly say that without my systems and structures, you know, all things being equal, where your systems and your structures are not changing. You are a mother today, you are a wife today, you are a wife without a child, you are a wife and now you have a child, you are jobless today, you, are, you have a job tomorrow. And so your systems and your structures are changing. How then do I keep consistency in prayer? How then do I stick to that 6 a.m., 6 p.m., 12 a.m. prayer? right, without breaking the pattern. Because we say that the power of prayer is in the consistency of prayer. Now, what men will do is this, that we will say that if it is not six o'clock consistently for a period of time, or if it is not 10 o'clock consistently for a period of time, then we have missed something. Then somehow the glory of God will not be seen or you will not see the glory of God or you will not have the encounter that you are looking for. That is not to say that if you put your faith in the fact that if I pray every day at six, right? I'm praying every day at six for maybe a month. I will not encounter God. You will encounter God. The fact is that your meeting is backed by belief, not necessarily the belief itself. So um, Genesis 28 verse 10. Um, I think to 22. The, no, it's Genesis 28. Some, I'm just at the, can you help me put the scripture? Where, um, I think Genesis 28 is the ladder, when Jacob has the ladder encounter. When Jacob has the, he sleeps, he puts, I think it's the same thing. He puts his head on the stone and then he, die, uh, he, he sleeps and then he gets the, he sees the angels ascending and descending, right? Now, the, the issue with the, the, the problem is that a lot of the times we are focusing on the place, right? There was a place that Jacob slept and Jacob got an encounter. So there is a place that is designed for me to have an encounter. But in fact, I am sure that many more people have slept in that same place, maybe not on that same stone, but in that same place and not had an encounter. Many more of us have slept in the place of, let me pray only six hours at 6 p.m., let me des uh, designate 12 a.m. Let me designate 1 a.m. to my prayer so that I would have an encounter. Many more of us may have done that and not had an encounter. And then there are those who have had encounters. There. That is not to say it is neither. It is neither here or there, right? But he sleeps there and then he has an encounter. The fact is that the encounter was not about the place as much as the encounter was about Jacob. So I could, I could be praying like Elijah. But the fact that I am not Elijah doesn't mean that I'm going to have the same encounters as Elijah. I, Bridget, could have slept where Jacob slept and not have an encounter uh, by virtue of the fact that I may not be in the covenants that Jacob was in. So Jacob could have, in fact, slept anywhere, right, and had the encounter. The point is that it was about him more than it was about the place. So if I make my prayer um, about a place and about a time, what I am doing is that I am removing the possibilities of God meeting me in other places, right? So I could be praying in my room today. And the fact that I have prayed in my room today means that there is a glory that fills this place, right? Automatically, the glory of God settles in my, in my place of prayer. That is not wrong but i think what the lord wants me to share is that lift the burden of i have to do it a certain way in order to receive from god especially when the certain way is not what god has called us to the point is that i want to be the image of god the point is that i want to pray without ceasing 
I want to be in the consistent mode of prayer. So I would see a Christian who is holy than thou in the place of prayer. And then when they get out of that place of prayer, they act like they weren't just in the presence of God, right? Because the mindset that I have with prayer is that this is the place of prayer. So when I come, I will repent of my sins. I will pray all the prayers that I've been taught to pray. And God being merciful, I will find that experience and that encounter in. But I leave that place of prayer without having achieved the purpose for which prayer was given to me. And the purpose is that we all with unveiled faces will become, as we behold the image of God, will become like the image of God. That is why prayer was given. In the garden, I'm Sister Denali, thank you for the scriptures. In the garden. Man is made in the image and in the likeness of God. And by virtue of that, he has access to the realms and the power and authority and the place of God. What has happened now is that we have lost that connection. And gradually you will see as scripture progresses from Genesis that further away, man becomes to move from God. Man is moving further away from God with every chapter that you read of men. To the point that the story of Noah and the ark had to come in because now God could not recognize himself in man. He says that every thought and imagination of man was wicked. Now there was no image of Christ found in man. And then a man, Adam, has a child called, um, I think Seth has a child called Enos and scripture says that now men begin to call on the Lord. Now this is the mode that God has given us through Christ. The, the gospel of reconciliation is to reconcile us back to the image of God. And the only way we can become the image of God is we have connection to know the, the one I'm supposed to have the image of, right? If I don't have any means by which I can know Christ, then I, I do not have the, the means to become like him. So he gives us this mode, this medium called prayer. And he says, call on me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. CWW's password. We call on him. The purpose is to, now the word call, sometimes you look at it as, hello, like I'm calling somebody, come. Right, but the word itself means to assemble, to gather, to meet. So what he's saying is that come and meet with me. It is in the meeting with him that we become like him. That is why prayer is a journey. Prayer is a journey that is leading me to the holies of holies, where I can, by the means that by the provision of Christ Jesus, his resurrection and his death, scripture says that when he died, the veil was torn. Now there is no veil. So that I don't have to be a priest, right? Um, and I'm using priest as in, um, ordained, you know, kind of thing. I don't have to be that ordained priest to get access to the Holy of Holies. But he says that you need to journey with me in that place of prayer. Jacob started off as a deceiver, right? That is who he was. But you see his life progressing to being more and more like the God who called him to be. We look at Jesus Christ and we are always saying, you know, Jesus Christ is always in that place of prayer. The scripture will say that he will go to a solitary place to pray and do all of those things. And Jesus himself says, I do what I see my father do. The only time and the only place that we see Jesus and the divine having communion is in that place of prayer, in that solitary place that he finds himself. And it didn't, it wasn't tied to Jerusalem, nor was it tied to Bethlehem, you would realize that everywhere that Jesus went, at every given time, he would wake up, right, and go. And sometimes after, you know, um, I think there's a scripture that says that when the fame of him began to spread abroad, he redrew. There were times that he would go to Christ, he would go to the Father, and the purpose of him going to the Father was to know his mind and to be like him. That is why he can confidently say, I don't do anything by myself, but I do what I see my father do, right? And someone will say, what about the scriptures? The scriptures tell us about God. The scriptures tell us about you know, um, Christ. The scriptures reveal Christ. But in fact, it says that the letter without the spirit is dead. 
So I can have scripture, but if I do not have experience and encounter with the God of the scripture, I am dead. This is what the Pharisees, this is the error of the Pharisees that will say that they had the Torah, they had the, 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 the word, but they did not have the experience of God. They do not have they did not know who he was. He was not revealed to them. There was no spirit. And that is what I believe Jesus Christ was pointing to. That you have the letter, but you do not have the spirit. And so the, let, the letter doesn't come alive to you. It is dead to you. So when we go to pray, and I think when I was thinking about this thing, and the Lord was like, imagine, right, if 90% of our prayer was focused on Lord, how can I become like you? In what areas have I failed to be like you? And 10% provisional. Where would we be as a body of Christ? The problem that we have with the church and with Christians, as we would call it, and believers, is that we preach Christ, but we are not a representation of Christ. We are not the image of Christ. We do not bear the fruit of Christ. We, people look at us and sometimes they wonder, is she really a Christian? But what prayer was given to us primarily was not provision. And you would say, if you are studying the lives of them that came before us, that a lot, there wasn't as much praying for bread and for butter and for provision as it was about what was God doing? What was God thinking? What was God planning? Elijah knew the mind of Christ. He knew what God had said. And so when it came time to, you know, say that it isn't going to rain, he said it wasn't going to rain, not because it came out of himself, but because God had already told the people through Moses. He says, like, if you do not follow me and if you fall away from me, this is what will happen. And because he knew the mind of Christ at the time, the mind of God, the intentions of God, he knew the image of God. He knew how head God was in the time when he said it, it coincided with what God was thinking. And so rain stopped. So prayer in itself is the journey by which we become like Christ. Prayer is not simply the journey by which we receive of Christ. These are byproducts. I am not saying that we do not pray to receive. We do not pray for healing. We do not pray. But I believe what the Lord is having me share with you is just this is, this is the ratio that dropped in my spirit as I was 90% of prayer. If 90% of the prayer of the believer was about becoming like Christ, where would we be as a church? Where would we be as a people of God? Where would we be in this um, world system where it seems like Christians are slowly and but surely losing the margins to the enemy? We are becoming smaller and smaller. All of a sudden, we are the minority. Because our focus when it comes to prayer is the means by which I receive from God rather than the means by which I access the mind and the realms of spirit, right? And the authority of God to do kingdom work. So Esther, um, I don't know if I have time to read on Esther. So Esther, Mordecai hears of um, this plot to kill all of Israel at a certain time. And so he persuades Esther somehow to, you know, join hands with him, fast and pray. So that is what Esther did. Esther fasted, Esther four, Esther five. That is what Esther did. He fasted and he prayed. Sorry, she fasted and she prayed. And at a set time, she got um, audience with, with, with um, sorry. She got audience with the king. Right? Now, first of all, my question is, when she got audience with the king, why didn't she just go and say, um, okay, this is what I want. This is what I need. Let me read it. Esther 5. Okay, so I'll, I'll read verse 5, um, chapter 5, because um, verse 4 is when she was preparing, when she was doing the fasting and all of those things. So now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gates of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court that he obtained, she obtained favor in her sight. And the king held out 
to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, What will thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be given thee to the half of the kingdom. And Esther answered and said, It is, if it seems good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Now, why didn't Esther simply just go ahead and say, oh, king, this is what Haman is plotting and my people are going to be dead and I will be dead in a couple of days or a couple of months or whatever the time frame was. Why didn't Esther just go ahead and say that make the request? But you realize that what Esther did is that she pauses, not that she's hesitate, hesitant or not that she doesn't know what she wants. And it's that she invites the king she invites the king. The invitation of the king is the presence of the king. The presence of the king was more important to Esther than just, you know, laying down my request or laying down her request because she knew that it meant more and it would mean more to her cause if she had the presence of God, of, of the king, sorry, with her. So Esther didn't. And so the next day, the king goes on. Um, let me, let me, where did that? Verse five. So then the king said, cause Haman to make haste that he may do as Esther had said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet and Esther, that Esther had prepared. And the king said unto Esther, at the banquet of wine, what is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? Even to the half of the kingdom, it shall be performed. Now the king is saying that, just ask me now. This is, this is, this is me right? This is me when my prayer is about receiving. And the king is like, okay, whatever I ask, I'll give you. Even to the half of my kingdom, I'll give you. I would have taken the half that he's given, right? I would have made my petition here and there because I have his ears. I have his, he's listening to me at this point. And then he says, she says, oh no, I'll make another banquet, right? And so in verse seven, then answered Esther and said, my petition and my request is if I have found favor in your sight of the king. And if it pleased the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them and I will do tomorrow as the king has said. So not only is she inviting the presence of the king once, she is ensuring that the second time around the king will be comfortable there, Right? She is making sure that when the king comes the second time, the first time you go to somebody's house, you're always like, okay, a, a bit cautious. When you come to somebody's house the second time, you are you are less, and it doesn't matter whether she was the queen or not. The king hardly went to the houses of the concubines and the, and the queens, right? So what Esther is doing is that she has the opportunity to make the request. It wasn't that like the king was... Uh, the king had lent his ears. And this is what we do. Let me say, this is what I do that has gotten me to the place and what the Lord is teaching me, that I am quick to make the request, forgetting that the request has more value to me when it comes with the presence. Right? The request, he can give it and he will give it, right? But what I miss out on is the presence, right? The presence of God. So, Esther doesn't make the request again, um, continuing on verse nine. So, you know, um, I, I think I, I have to skip to verse seven. Is it? Yes, verse seven. So verse seven, one, so the king and Haman came back the second time, right? And then now Esther is laying down the petition. Verse two, he says that, and the king said unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine, what is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to the half of the kingdom. Then Esther the queen answered and said, if I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given unto, be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold. Right, and I am I and my people to be destroyed, to be slain, to perish. But if we had been sold to bondage, it would have been fine. Um, I want to skip 
because I look like it looks like I'm going to be reading a lot. So now the petition is made, right? But we see a hesitation, even in the king. The king has said, ask whatever it is and I will give you, right? But verse seven says that, and the king arises from the banquet of wine and in his wrath, he just left. He didn't say anything to Haman. He didn't respond in any way. But then when he left, verse eight, he returns. And when he returns, he stumbles upon something. That to him seemed, I don't know, but it angered him even the more, right? And it was in that state that he decided that let us punish Haman. Now, the point that the Lord was making is that imagine she had made the request there. What would have happened is that the Lord, was, the king would say, investigate. And Haman would have found a way around it. Now, the request has been made. It has been granted. Okay, Haman is trying to kill the people. Let us find a way to punish Haman. Haman would definitely, with his power and his authority, would have come and found a way around it. And a lot of us, we ask for healing myself. And then the enemy is like, I, I, I have legal grounds here. Because I went and I asked. I was not in the presence of God. So whatever he was doing, I was not able to counter it. Haman would have found a way to counter it or to you know, minimize the effects or the punishment that he would have. Now, maybe they wouldn't have died, but Naaman would have opportunity to plan again. But because the presence of the king was with Esther, when Naaman acted, even though he was simply begging, it looked more dire than just a simple beg. And because she had the presence, she was able to deal with Haman, right? The hesitation of the king in the first instance was that the king was not simply going to kill Haman because the, Haman was the king's right-hand man. But because he was with Esther and he saw what he saw, now he is able to overrule Haman. Now he's able to deal with Haman in a way that brings peace to Esther. So now when I go to the place of prayer, I can do two things. I can see prayer as the place where I go and I make my request and God will give me, right? A lot of the times we receive the blessings of God and we, we feel sure. Sometimes you receive the blessings of God and you are more depressed in the blessing than you were before the blessing. Why? Because you got the blessing, but you did not get the presence. And prayer is not intended for us to simply get the blessing, but also to get the presence. Um, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. It says that, but he who is joined with the Lord is one spirit with him. He who is joined with the Lord is one spirit with him. What we want from prayer is to be joined with the Lord and be one spirit with him. I see Jesus Christ is walking and then she, he sees this woman whose son is dead, whose husband is already dead. And now his only, the one son that she has is gone. Now scripture says that he had compassion for the woman. And by that compassion, he's able to say that, boy, rise, right? Rise. Now we see Jesus' operations also in areas where he's, he is like he has pointed to a certain person or a certain place, and then he moves to that place. Like the Samaritan woman, Jesus already knew. It wasn't like a bypass. Jesus already knew, right, that he was going to meet the Samaritan woman. Like the man at the pool, Jesus already knew that he was going to meet the man at the pool. So we see the difference in Jesus' operations, where there are miracles that he does, that he is fully aware of the miracles that he is going to do. So his his moves and his directions are toward that person or that place. And then we also see Jesus moving in areas where he's not really planning on. He just encounters somebody, right? Like blind Bartimaeus crying out, son of Judah. Like the woman, um, the, the woman who holds the hem of his garment. And scripture says that virtue came out of him. Where did that power come from? That power did not come from Jesus, the man. That power came from Jesus, the God. 
Now, what Jesus has done is that the man Jesus and the God Jesus have become one in flesh, right? And sometimes because we say that it's Jesus, we think it's automatic. It isn't automatic that the man Jesus and the God Jesus becomes one in the operations of Jesus' miracle. But it is because prayer is a part of his life. That is how come as he walked the earth, because if he was not walking as fully man, then his death was meaningless. But because he walked as fully man, how then did he do the miracles that he did? Because he was joined with God and therefore he was one spirit with him. So it wasn't a matter of let me pray for the miracle to happen, but that if I feel compassion towards this person, I can get out of myself and say, wake up and the spirit of God, which is one with my spirit, will cooperate with me and then bring life. Right. So the disciples meet a man by the gate called beautiful and says, what I have, I give to you. What did they have? Because they were men. Now, what they had is their spirits joined with the spirit of God. So they can pull not from their own spirit, but from the spirit of God who is in them. That is what prayer has been given to me to achieve. So if I have prayed for 10 years, if I have prayed for 20 years and Lord have mercy on me and I have not achieved this, that means I have missed the point of prayer. If God wanted to give to the Israelites, they didn't have to pray. It could rain manna. It could rain quail. If God wanted to give them, they didn't have to ask. Abraham did not go and ask for a son. God said, I will give you a son. God said, I will give you a son. So when it comes to provision, God wants us to have provision and he can give us provision. But what he cannot give us without our complete partnership is his image. We cannot have the image of God without completely partnering with God. So it takes my intentional posture, going into the place of prayer and saying, I have not come simply to ask, or I have not even come to ask at all, but I have come to see um, um, one of the translations of prayer that I like is tefila. I have come to self-examine and see how do I look like you and in what ways do I not look like you and then we can commune in that place so that I become more like Christ because what the world is looking for is not another Bridget what the world is looking for is Christ what the world wants to see is the risen Jesus in me and yet somehow I seem to have failed in revealing Jesus because I have made my prayer a destination where I go to collect or where I go to dump rather than the journey that brings me to the holies of holies where wherever I go, I am carrying the presence of God. I am carrying the mind of God and I am carrying the oracle of God with me. So he says that prayer is not your destination. You have not come to offload. You have not simply come to take on you have not simply come to a place and when you move out of the place it's like you forget everything that happened in the place and we fall into this myself we fall into where we are praying and we are all in the mood we are all in the space the spirit is moving and then when i move out it's like a switch has gone off right my my the mode that i have the experience that i'm having seem to have been left behind in that space and only rekindles itself when I come back into that space. But I am not made in that. Prayer was not given to me to, to feed my hunger. Prayer was given to me to build the, the, the to build an image of God that men will see and be drawn to him. Right. That is why he gave me prayer. And so I find the Lord challenging me and probably challenging all of us that in the sense that 90 percent of my prayer, can I challenge you that 90 percent of your prayer, probably even 99 percent of your prayer would be that, God, I want to be like you. I am. I desire to be like you. I want to return to having your image so that every step that I am taking, I am conscious of the fact that I want to be like God. I am trying to be like God. I am working in becoming like God. Not simply that I came to make a request. I came to the bank to, you know, get my check, get my cash or whatever it is that I came to. And then when I'm gone, I forget everything about you. But to carry that mode, that medium of connection with the Lord with me, 
until I get to fully be the image of God, till I get to fully be a representation of God, till I get to be, um, um, Genesis says that we are made in the image of like uh, of his life. The word image is Salem, and Salem means to be an idol, a photocopy. It means to be a shadow, right? Uh, I cannot be fat, and then you see my shadow is, is slim. So for a lot of us, God is fat, but I, his shadow, I'm slim. The shadow is always equal to the image. If I am a tall person, if I am dependent on the sun, but the features, right? Okay, let me use this example. This is better. I can't be a human with an image of a dog. I can't be a human with, I'm um, sorry, with the shadow of a dog or with the shadow of a fish. If I, if you see a human walking, the shadow that you expect to see is a fish, right? So the word means that if I see Jesus, if I see Christ, the shadow, which is me, Bridget, should be the same as Christ. But I find that a lot of the times Christ is, but the shadow that I am portraying, I am portraying a shadow of probably a fish or probably a monkey or probably something. But the image does not match. God's image does not match me, who is supposed to be his shadow. And that is why prayer is not supposed to be treated as a destination. Prayer shouldn't be treated as a destination. But if we will renew our minds and say that prayer is like the air that I breathe, right? He can challenge us to pray without ceasing and have consistency in prayer because that is how prayer is supposed to be. Prayer is supposed to be the, the, the fuel by which I, I, you know, I move or the car by whatever the, you know, the interpretation that you would have that would make sense to you, that prayer is the air that I breathe, that as I am walking, as I am moving, as I am sleeping, I am inconsistently in that mode of prayer. And the end gain of prayer is to get me to the holies of holies. It is to get me to become the image of God. If I have not become the image of God through prayer, then I have not utilized the power that God has given us to given us in prayer. I have to be like God. I have to come out of prayer and be even more like God today than I was yesterday. I have to always have built some kind of image. Maybe the eye, maybe the ear now looks like, maybe my lips now looks like Christ. Maybe, but I have to always come out of prayer having built a certain measure of the image of God in myself. Now then, that is where I have actually used prayer for the purpose for which prayer was given. Because when it says that men began to call on God, it was because now man was seeking to find his own identity back. Man has moved from the place where um, we, have, we, have, we have metamorphosized into the image of the enemy, right? So in today's world, we see that happening again where we are being, um, what is it called? Assimilated into the image of the world. So this is what the world is with feminism, Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ, XY, whatever. We are being morphed into the image of society and we are going along with it. And for some of us, we are not even doing anything about it. For some of us, we don't even feel the hurt of the Lord in these things that we see around us. We are still going about praying for our car and our children and our money and our business and all of that. And we do not understand that what is happening, the labor pains of the end time that is happening is the time where we pray the mind of Christ, where we pray the kingdom of God to come here on earth as it is in heaven. And if I am praying, my prayer time is all about bread and butter. Then, in fact, I have failed. I have totally failed. I have totally failed and totally misused the essence and the purpose for which prayer was given, right? So, scripture says that Christ did what he took the form of man. He took on the form of man. In order for Christ to come and deliver us, he took the form of man. And he's simply asking us, take the form of God now. It is your turn, it is my turn. He has come, he has taken your form, he has died on the cross, he has done the thing for you. Now he's saying that by Christ, I have become that link. I have become that link 
that you are able to now morph back into the image of God. Um, I, the, the, the same scripture, um, Genesis, was it Genesis 28, when Jacob is seeing the angels ascending and descending, right? And I'm just like, Lali, can you help me find the scripture that Jesus says that we will see, he, um, I think he's speaking to the disciples and he says that they will see angels and descending upon the son of man, right? They are descending upon the son of man. And then contrast it for me with the scripture in Genesis where Jacob says that he's seeing um, angels ascend and descend on the ladder, right? He says that I see a ladder and I see angels ascend and descend upon this ladder and replace that ladder with Jesus Christ because now Jesus Christ is the ladder upon which angels are ascending and descending. Jesus is the link. And Jesus is the way, and Jesus is the means by which that is why he says, when you ask the Father, ask in my name, don't just go and ask. Jesus is the means, is the example for us that he morphed into man to bring us deliverance. The way that we are delivered is that we become and we take the form of God. And what I'm learning is that prayer is the only way that I can do that. Not by mind, nor by power, but by my spirit. I can read the Bible a million times over, and if I do not have um, the spirit with me, right, it doesn't do much. It doesn't do anything. And then also, on the other hand, I can read the scripture that says that do not lie. But if I have not communed with the Lord and have a deposit of him in me, it becomes challenging for me to not lie because I am I have taken the form of the enemy. I have taken the form of wickedness and lying. Sin is part of me now lying is part of me cheating is probably is part of me pride is part of me all of these things are part of me and he says that we cannot be like christ if we still hold on to this weight and these sins that easily beset us how do i move from there it isn't simply by knowing what the word says then i become a pharisee but it is that i come to that place of prayer, that I access prayer, that I use prayer for the purpose for which it was given, which is to be the access, the medium by which I access God's mind, I access his power, I access his authority, I access his image by which I become like God. So what are you using your prayer for? I believe this is the challenge that the Lord will have me share with you, that I am, what are you using your prayer time for? Right, if you're praying, 30, hour, 30 minutes or one hour. Can you confidently say that 90% or 99%, right? Because 90 to 10 is what I, I, I had in my spirit. But let's say 99% of you. What do you pray about 99% of your time? Because a lot of us, 99% of our prayer time, we are praying for things in the guise, there's guise as intercession. I'm interceding for my husband. I'm interceding for my job. I'm interceding for my children. I'm interceding for my business. It is all the I, 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 my, 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 my. And we have somehow come to the understanding that all of these things are part of God's kingdom. But if I would pray the kingdom of God come, let me be the image of God. You would realize that all of these things naturally fall into place. When Adam was walking in the image, in the power, in the authority of God, God. He didn't have to toil. He didn't have to strive. There was no need for the sweat of his brow. All the Lord said was keep. That means I had to make sure that maybe I would trim here and there, but I didn't have to dig. I didn't have to give the land extra water. I didn't have to. That is not what. Provision came naturally in the presence of God for Adam and Eve. And it is when we moved out of the presence of God that provision became a worry, a weight, and a challenge for man. So imagine 99% of our prayer. We are journeying with God to become more like him to the extent that now we carry his presence with us. Provision will naturally come. We wouldn't have to toil. It wouldn't have to be the sweat of the brow. We pray more for these things because we have not come to the presence of God right? We pray more for these things. The Lord says, Abraham says that, he says to Isaac, do not worry about it. The Lord will provide for himself, not even for me, for himself. 
So my feeding and my being alive and my sustenance, that, that, that provision, God is going to provide for himself. Why? Because my being here alone plays a part in his kingdom agenda. My children thrive. That alone plays a part in his kingdom agenda. The righteous will not forsake him. Our children will not beg for bread. He said it. He says it and he performs it. He makes haste to perform it. When I am in line with him, when I am more like him, when my, my time in his presence is all about, God, what are you doing? How can I partner with you? What can I do? What can I say? Where can I sit? What can I cease doing? Where can That should be prayer. That should be prayer for the believer. If it came to simply asking for, for provision, right? A lot of the times we are toiling for healing. We are stressing for healing and have mercy on me. But the reason why we are toiling and we, we, we disguise this as I'm having faith, right? But in fact, <laughs> I heard someone tell me that if you really had faith, you would have stopped praying about it because you would trust that he heard you the first time and he will provide. You would probably move out of consistently bombarding heaven's door to thanking the Lord because he says what you ask, believe that you have received, right? And then if it is an issue of Daniel and um the oppression of the territorial spirits, because a lot of the time we make it about that, oh, we don't know, maybe the devil is hindering us. But if you knew the mind of Christ, you will know that this situation has been tempered with by the enemy. So I wouldn't use that Daniel scripture as my reason for always knocking and bombarding on the door of the Lord and saying that you said I should ask you, give me this, give me that. And then the other thing that we will use is the woman. Jesus is telling a parable. And it is the parable where he says that, that men ought to always pray and not faint. And so this woman is banging on the, and I would use that. So she was banging. But the point is that she was banging on an unbelieving man, on an unrighteous man. I am banging on the door of a righteous God. A God who says that if you ask me for bread, I will not give you stone. So it is a parable. It doesn't mean that that is God. It doesn't mean that God is saying that keep banging on my door for healing or keep banging. Because if indeed I believed that God had given me the healing that I was asking him for, then I would ask, Father, give me healing. I need healing in my whichever part of my body. And quickly move to thanking God and saying that, Father, I thank you for this. I thank you that I am healed. I thank you that I am healed. And sit in the place of thanksgiving. Right. Rather than making excuses by wrongly dividing the word of God and then using it to please and justify why I'm praying so hard, why I'm praying um, in the way that I am praying. If I have captured the presence of God and if I have captured the mind of Christ, if I have captured his ways and his wills and his perfect plan for us, he says that be transformed so that you know what his perfect will is for you by the renewing of your mind, that you will know what his perfect plan and his will for you. If I knew that, then I would know from afar that this is a demonic thing and this is just me waiting on God, then I will know how to deal with it. So then my prayer is not, you know, bombarded with a whole list that is all about me, 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 me. I was writing something this afternoon and it's like, the Lord said, to me, we use, I am a child of God, so God will give me as a way of saying that I have faith in God. But in fact, our sentence is always starting with an act, right? We are not saying that God is good. So I'm asking him for this. Maybe he will give me. And even if he doesn't give me, he's still good. But the demand is that I am a child of God. And again, I'm not saying this is not for you, but I'm just sharing with you what the Lord is saying to me. So do not use the I am a child of God. So God will give me healing. I'm a child of God. So God will give me money. I'm a child of God. So God, no. God will give me because he is God. God gave me his son because he was God. Not because I was righteous. Not because I was good. He says, whilst I was yet a sinner, he gave his son to come and die for me. So he gives because he is. He gives not because I am a child of God or because I'm walking lowly and right before him. He gives because of who he is. Right. So again, 
we are journeying in the place of prayer and we do not arrive until we have become the image of God, the likeness of God, wielding power and dominion in the areas that he has called us to. And that is why we have prayer. That is the, that is the reason why he gave us prayer. So um, I would, uh, I would like us to pray, just pray for yourself, right? Because these things, it requires the spirit of the Lord to reveal to you and say that, yes, Charlie, this that you are doing is more selfish than it is selfless. This is more about you than it is about God. So just pray the language of the spirit. He says that I have not seen yet what he has done. But the part that I like is that the spirit of the Lord reveals. He has revealed to us by his spirit. And so by his spirit, he will reveal to us. Scripture also says that we do not know what we should pray. And so the Holy Spirit helps us. So if you are able to unmute, I would ask that you unmute. And our prayer is simply this, that where we have gone wrong in our desires, especially in that place of prayer, Father, we are asking that you will help us and redirect us, reset us, retune us in the mighty name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Ya <laughs> <laughs> 
in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you. We bless your holy name. Amen. Um, thank you for joining. Thank you for staying. Shall we unmute and share the grace and then proceed to pray for husbands? Before we do that, Sister Bridget, can we all corporately just pray for Sister Bridget? Just a minute, pray for Sister Bridget. We ask that the Lord will replenish her and fill her and uh, give her more depth into the 